We are going to talk a little bit today about um, higher order derivatives. Um, you've been using the product and quotient rule to find derivatives, um, but we can actually find derivatives more than once, and we call those higher order derivatives. Uh, one of the prime examples of why we would want to do this is with the position function. We talked last week about how we can find a velocity function by taking the derivative of the position function. So if we have the position function, s of t, remember this is our position function, if we want to know the instantaneous rate of change, we take the derivative of it, and this is the velocity. So this is position function. We take the derivative of the position function, that is the velocity. Okay, and using that, we can find our instantaneous velocity anywhere, um, anywhere in the function. Now, if we want to know how fast the velocity is changing, we want to know the acceleration of an object, we take the derivative of the velocity function, which is the second derivative of the position function. And so this would give us the acceleration function. Okay, So if you start with the position function, the first derivative is velocity function. The second derivative is the acceleration function. Because you start with the position function, if you want to know how fast your position is changing with respect to time, that's velocity. If you want to know how fast your velocity is changing with respect to time, that's acceleration. So we're going to do some higher order derivatives and then we'll come back to this um, whole position function idea. So the second derivative is an example of a higher order derivative. You can take third, fourth, fifth, sixth, nth derivative, all of them. It's so much fun. Okay, we want to find the second derivative of this function. It's a pretty basic function, so first we have to find the first derivative. Um, so let's see, 4 times 5, that's 20x to the fourth minus 6x. And then to find the second derivative, we, uh, we just put two little apostrophes there, that means second derivative, and we take the derivative of that thing. So 80x cubed minus 6. And that's the second derivative. All right, we want to find the second derivative of secant. So we need first get the first derivative. We talked about this yesterday. The derivative of secant is secant tangent. And then we need the second derivative. Um, this is going to be a little longer, so I'm going to come over here. So now we need to take the derivative of this. This is a product rule. So we need one derivative of two. So the derivative of tangent is secant squared plus two, that's tangent, derivative of one. So the derivative of secant is secant tangent. Okay, so remember that was one d2 plus two d1. That's the product rule, everyone. All right, um, simplifying this. I don't know. They both have a secant in common, so we could factor out a secant x if you wanted. And that's going to leave us with secant squared x plus tangent squared x. Okay, and this is our second derivative. Okay. Um, we want to find the fourth derivative of 4 sine x. So the first derivative. 4 just gets to stay there. The derivative of sine is cosine. Second derivative, 4 gets to stay there. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. Uh, we're going to take the third derivative. Uh, negative 4 gets to stay there. The derivative of sine is cosine. And then the fourth derivative, okay, we use the little apostrophe things for the first, second, and third derivative. And once you get past the third derivative, we actually use numbers because all those apostrophes get confusing. So fourth derivative is going to look like this, and anything higher than fourth derivative is going to look like that as well. Um, let's see, the negative 4 stays there, and the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So the fourth derivative is 4 sine x. All right, this is the last problem today, short day. All right, because there is no atmosphere on the moon, an object on the moon encounters no air resistance. 
In 1971, astronaut David Scott demonstrated that a feather and a hammer fall at the same rate on the moon. The position function for each of these falling objects is S of t and negative 0.81 t squared plus 2. S of t is in meters and t is the time in seconds. We want to know what's the ratio of Earth's gravitational force to the moon's. So what we want to find is the acceleration due to gravity on the moon. Okay, so what we have is a position function, s of t equals negative 0.81 t squared plus 2. We want to find acceleration due to gravity for the moon. So the first derivative of this will give us the velocity function. So if we take the first derivative of that, uh, negative 0.81 times 2, um, we have 1.62 t, the derivative of 2 is just 0. And then we want the acceleration, so the second derivative of this, is the derivative of velocity, and that will give us the acceleration function. You don't really need to write all that down, but I'm just explaining what we're actually doing. So we want the derivative of negative 1.62t, which is negative 1.62. Okay. So on Earth, we want to know the ratio of Earth's gravitational force. So ratio of Earth to Moon. Now remember, acceleration due to gravity on Earth is, uh, are we in meters here? Yes, meters per second squared is negative 9.8, or nine, negative 9.81, if you insist on using that. Um, and then acceleration due to gravity on the moon is negative 1.62. And we're just going to divide that. I don't know what that is. Let's try it. 9.8.62. And it comes out to right around 6. I know there's a decimal in there. So that means that gravity um, on Earth is six times stronger than the gravity on the moon. What a fascinating thing to know.